Thank you, Uli. I first want to thank uh, Joost Lelifeld and the Max Planck Institute for inviting me to this joyous, great occasion. It's also a great honor for me uh, to be here. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the problem I've been thinking about last few years. So first exp I'll explain to you what I mean by the two worlds. This idea sort of came to me uh, early this year. I spent 10 weeks uh, living in villages in India, eating in homes such as this woman I'm showing on the right-hand side. After every week or 10 days, I would get totally exhausted living under harsh conditions. I would retreat into the world of the top four billion just for air-conditioned room, a cold glass of beer, etc. It was after doing this three, four times during this 10-week period, I discovered that there are indeed two different planets or two different worlds. And they're sort of codependent. First is, the, of course, the top four billion. Oh, sir. Who seem to behave as if fossil fuel is unlimited. The main problem they have is consumption. And all this talk about decarbonization, reducing carbon footprint, really applies to this four billion. The other three billion, the bottom three billion, which I found living in the villages, have no access to fossil fuels. Or if there is access, they can't afford it. Of course, we know their population is, is their nemesis. What they really need is clean energy access, okay? So you can ask by now, I'm an atmospheric physicist. What am I doing in a kitchen in a remote part of the, uh, India? For that, I have to address what brought me to the orbit of chemists, particularly Crutzen's orbit. So this paper, a year after the famous uh, Molina Rowland paper, I stumbled onto the fact that chlorofluorocarbons are also enormously powerful greenhouse gases. This thing I estimate is the reduction of the infrared energy leaving the planet, sine is negative, as a function of the concentration of CFC. It's basically taking quantum mechanics of this, quantum mechanical parameters of this uh, CFCs and estimating radiative transfer. So this is now is what's called radiative forcing, by the way. We then, those days, had a most simple climate model. So that's the temperature change. That is the forcing of the greenhouse effect. The bottom is the rate at which heat escapes the planet. I had used some simple estimates from a climate bodico, came up with this number for the so-called feedback, it surprisingly is within 10% of what Susan Solomon's AR4 came up with. So when you relate all this, you find even at two parts per billion, the CFCs 11 and 12 can cause as much as a degree warming, pretty as large as CO2. So basically per molecule, their warming effect is to 10 to 15,000 times as CO2. And you can see the references used, Molina's paper and Ralph Cicero. This was, I was a postdoc at Langley. This was what I did in the nighttime. My daytime job was to track down the Paul Crutzen's Knox ozone destruction. What would it do to climate? My finding was through complex set of interactions, decrease in stratospheric ozone would cool the planet. What these two papers got me was a job at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. My postdoc at NASA was running out and they couldn't extend me, and that brought me directly in contact with Paul Crutzen. So we used to meet in the basement of NCAR Computing Center. So the first paper which came out of that was the ozone, which is produced a smog reactions, was also already having a warming effect, so that solid line is the radiative effect of the increase in the ozone. So ozone also got into the picture of global warming. And Paul left NCAR in 1980, and Ralph joined us. So I got into Ralph's orbit. 
So together we published this paper, but by this time, a Pandora's box of greenhouse gases was added to the list. So what we concluded was, as of 1980, these other trace gases were contributing as much as 50%. And then we made a projection going forward 50 years, the trace gases will contribute almost as much as CO2. This to be contrasted compared with what the Solomon et al. report concluded, the non-CO2 greenhouse forcing was almost 80% of CO2 in the range of what we had computed, okay? So, is this, about this time, my interest change was moving into understanding the role of clouds. Basically, how are clouds regulating the temperature of the planet? And I did a field experiment in the Pacific, in, the, in Fiji, uh, in the Pacific Ocean. What we found to our surprise, the amount of sunlight reaching the ocean was significantly less than what our models were predicting. And inferred from that, that this must be because the models are missing an important atmospheric physics, which is absorbing sunlight. So that brings me to the black carbon story, is when Paul and I started collaborating pretty actively. This was a major field experiment, and the principal investigators were shown on the top. It's basically a collaboration between Max Planck Institute, India's uh, government laboratory, and the center I was directing at Scripps. So there it is, you can see Paul and myself on the C-130 plane of NCAR. We were in the Arabian Sea, looking at vast plumes of brown clouds. Okay. The major thing which, one of the things, at least my part of the work is that the enormous absorption by black carbon. So we had found our missing physics. This shows the reduction of sunlight at the ground. Remember we saw the prediction by Paul as part of the nuclear winter, the dimming at the surface due to nuclear explosion, but this is happening all the time in our Arabian Sea. The reduction of sunlight, this optical depth is a technical unit. Think of it as the total number of particles in the air multiplied by cross section. And this was about the maximum pollution we saw over the Arabian Sea and in India. The reduction in sunlight, this unit, is almost 15% of the incoming sunlight, okay? Later, we confirmed that this was coming from atmospheric absorption by black carbon using unmanned aircraft. So when we, I took all of this data and put it together with satellite data, we came up with this uh, disturbing conclusion that black carbon was imposing about 0.9 watts per meter square heating globally Remember, black carbon is just not an India problem. It's everywhere it's emitted. And this was almost about half as much as CO2, making it the second largest contributor to global warming. So by the time it became clear, it was impacting this region varieties of ways. That's the plume you see in the Indo-Gangetic Plains falling over the Bay of Bengal. And so on the physical side, the heating by black carbon was contributing to disruption of the monsoon, and we had deduced melting of the glaciers. And then this was a study done with Mark Flanner. We found the black carbon was depositing on the uh, uh, glaciers here and contributed directly to the melting. And the dimming at the surface, the reduction of sunlight, was decreasing rainfall. So this is as for the physical climate. On the left-hand side is the air pollution effects about half a million deaths just from the indoor smoke and then million tons of crop damages. By the way, the major finding by several groups contributed to that, about half of the black carbon observed over India is coming from cook stoves, okay? So this became clear to us. This has become a huge issue of sustainability so we met with the uh, head of UNEP at that time, Klaus, Dr. Klaus Topfer, who is here in the audience. That's A.P. Mitra, the PI from India. Uh, Hung Guyen was a remarkable uh, administrator. He helped us with the field observations tremendously. And, and the next day, Paul had to leave that night. I took Klaus on a chartered flight 
and we found these brown clouds surrounding most of Himalayas. Okay? And clouds immediately within formed this atmospheric brown cloud program with Paul and myself as co-chairs. And we released a series of reports, perhaps the first of its kind, focusing on regional impacts. This particular one was Henning Rother and myself, you know, uh, chaired the various parts of it. So there was a huge problem. I saw also in this a huge solution because we know how to get rid of these pollutants, right? So came this idea of short-lived climate warming pollutants. There are basically four of them, methane, lifetime of decade, HFCs, replacement for CS, halocarbons, black carbon, and ozone. What we found, remember the red line is currently business as usual. As I'll convince you soon, that is the top four billion problem, T4B. And we found cutting down CO2 even massively by 50% is not going to do much to the near-term warming, but of course is critical for long-term warming. We found the only way you can temp keep the temperatures under two degrees is do CO2 on the short-lived climate pollutants simultaneously. Okay? So we can keep it still under two degrees, and this is the sea level effect that we can still keep the sea level under one meter. This paper was published this year with a group experts on sea. So this was a huge opportunity in the following sense. We have a chance to show, at least in the near term, test our theories, the beauty of the short-lived climate pollutants, soot, if you get rid of it today, their forcing is gone. I'll show you some observation examples. The climate effect would take longer, of course. So then UNA formed a committee, and I was a vice chair of this with Drew Schindel. We released a report prompt, oh, sorry. So in 2012, Hillary Clinton, our Secretary of State and Minister from Sweden, formed this Climate and Clean Air Coalition under UNEP. Bringing me back to the topic, the SLCPs intersect with development issues, the bottom three billion issues. That's what I'm slowly taking you to. So let me get back into the kitchen. So why am I here? Because to get rid of the black carbon, it's the second largest source of black carbon, indoor residential cooking. And I was shocked to find when I got into this field, about 2.7 billion still rely on this type of cooking, okay? And about 4.2 million, the recent report, die each year from air pollution, both indoors and outdoors. Yeah, I forgot to mention to you, I was living in a hut or house close to this woman. When I met her, I told her, do you know your indoor pollution goes outdoor? She looked at me skeptically and said, oh, you're an American scientist. You bring all these fanciful ideas to us. I persuaded her to come outside the house, and that was the smoke. And why did we see the river of pollution? There are 160 million such homes along the Indo-Gangetic Plains. So uh, my interest got into actually doing something in the field, and we started this project, Suya, provide to provide clean cooking, and Mr. Rahman is a brilliant social scientist, expert on rural intervention, and this Ramanathan is my daughter. She's an expert on wireless technologies, building sensors. So she developed, see my instruments all cost 25 to 50,000. So we needed to instrument almost every hut, okay, to make mass amount of measurements. So she came up with an inexpensive sensor using cell phones. I'm not going to get into the detail. So using that, we tested various cooking technologies. So that is the traditional mud stove and several other stoves that we found what really helped to cut down the pollution by 90%, both in terms of exposure, the breathing zone, and what comes out of the stove. But this sort of stove, which basically encloses the combustion chamber, and then it has a forced draft fan operated by solar to have complete combustion. So we now have a technology which would get rid of this problem, still uses biomass, by mind you, but the problem with that was cost. It was costing 
$70. By the way, their lighting is from kerosene, another major source of soot pollution. So now we have started a carbon credit pilot phase. So we have about 1,000 homes enrolled. And using cell phones, we hook each woman to the voluntary carbon market. There are two major carbon markets in the US working with this. So we'll get accredited by end of this year. So she takes a loan from a rural bank. Government of India is working with us now, gives her six person loan. And my daughter fits a sensor here. The data comes to my lab. I convert that into carbon credit, send it to the carbon market, and they get paid every month. So by December, the money will start rolling into these women's hands. So we'll see if that would scale it up. The other thing I want to talk about here, this whole thing about this short-lived climate pollutants, is that it's not theory, it's happening. The other spectacular example, diesel is this another third to fourth major source of black carbon. I just published a three-year study in which we showed black carbon concentrations over most of California has come down by 50%. And we were able to directly link it to policies enforced by California, basically switching to ultra-low sulfur diesel and particulate filters. It just gets rid of the whole black carbon. And you see the effect outside, okay? So I said, why not we do this in India and China? So fortunately, World Bank took us and funded us to start a new program between India and California to mitigate air pollution from the transportation sector. We met about a month ago. Our governor, Jerry Brown, came to our meeting and gave tremendous support. So we are now enrolling three state governments in India to see, to translate what California did to Indian states. So this, hopefully by next spring, we will have some more progress on this. These are just two examples of where we don't have to wait for 160 nations to sign on a piece of paper. We can start climate mitigation individually at small scales. I'm not claiming that's going to solve the problem. At least we are not sitting in one place, not doing much. So let me take back to this, my two old idea. So my thesis is the top four billion for their own preservation has to provide energy access to the bottom three billion. So let me walk you through the numbers. This we all know, the first statement, the carbon footprint of the top four billion is the biggest threat to B3B sustainability. We are right now putting 36 gigatons and IPCC has estimated, and I agree with the numbers, we got to cut it by a factor of two by 2050 to have any chance to keep the warming below two degrees. Let's not forget more than 90% of the emissions from T4B. The sobering thing, which I've not seen discussed, this comes from economists and technologists, the diffusion time. Meaning, let's say you have a disruptive revolutionary technology today. That to penetrate, like India and China, is minimum 35 years, 25 to 35, okay? So our option is, of course, this is not my idea, so I'll come IPCC, T4B's footprint might decrease, or we need to decarbonize the economy. So let me go to the bottom three billion. This is the energy consumption, and the, the entire three billion, they are here, less than 5%, okay? So decarbonization of T4B, requires about one to two trillion per year per investment. But this is the International Energy Agency estimate. YASA and a group from India have estimated this, that providing clean energy access to the bottom three billion is an $85 billion per year problem, investment. One-tenth to one, you know, 20th, okay? So let's take a look at this from the bottom three billion. During this century, we all know, the bottom three billion will morph into the bottom five billion. So B3B will become planet B5B. If the B3B follows T4 billion, I have seen this in India, at least millions have the same standard of carbon footprint as some people in the West, okay? 
So if they follow us on the fossil fuel path, their footprint will increase from 0.7 to 4.5, and, and the B3B's emission alone will grow to 23 billion. Remember, we have to bring the T4B's from 38 to 16. If theirs increase from 0 to 23, we'll still be emitting the same amount 50 years from now. So, sorry. So it is in our own self-interest to help the bottom three billion on a sustainable energy pathway for meeting basic needs, cooking, heating, lighting, and farming. Why did I add farming? You know, I have 25 gigabytes worth of interviews with farmers and village women in the last, you know, uh, 10 weeks I spent. What I learned, most Indian farmers, they have only five acres. So if they have one crop, which is all they can do because they have no energy, it just sustains their food needs. They need the second and third crop to really have money for education, etc. So that's one of the reasons they migrate into big cities. So, and what it, the, the thing I want to propose, this is of course not my idea, economists have proposed this, distributed solar would work interestingly in primitive conditions. So I'm showing you the school in the village I hail from. It's just next to my grandfather's house. This is a school for about 50, it holds from first grade to fifth grade. So three years ago, I bought, I bought them a TV so that they can have ed education and fans because the temperature gets 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry for using American units. And then I brought them a computer, but they couldn't use it because the electricity comes only three hours a day and they don't know which three hours it'll come. It could be midnight, it could be early morning. So I bought them a solar to charge it. Guess where I bought the solar? just two kilometers from this village. It shows solar microgrids has penetrated deep everywhere. So I bought a solar for $400, just powers the whole system, just for during the daytime, okay? So I think distributed solar, I feel, is, is a promising way for the energy access. I feel that I've run out of time, so I'm going to skip this, and I want to... Happy birthday, Paul. Thank you for more than three decades of warm friendship, stimulating collaboration, and unforgettable brainstorming sessions. That's what I enjoyed with my uh, collaboration, Paul. Thank you.